When it comes to the Dwarven Kingdom, not just in Overlord, but other series and games alike, they have always been a race that I have always enjoyed very thoroughly, and the Dwarven Kingdom in Overlord is no exception to that. They are a very deep embedded, but still mysterious race as itself, and their kingdom definitely has some interesting back lore to them. I have done a previous video on room crafting, if you are interested in that, and there is definitely a lot of stuff that is deep embedded into their lore, their history, and how they have risen to a goal golden age and they've risen so high as a race and as a kingdom and then fallen so far down. But because they are such an isolated race that don't like to really get into the affairs of other races, especially other demi-humans, but particularly other human kingdoms, they have always isolated themselves from the affairs of other races, which has left a lot of mysteriousness on them, a lot of people wondering where they are, a lot of people don't even know where the Dwarven Kingdom is in the actual New World itself. Other natives and humans alike don't even know where these dwarven people are because of just how isolated they have become from the outside world itself and because there isn't any relations going on between other kingdoms humans trying to do much trading with the dwarven people it has left a lot of mystery on it on the other hand there are some trading that goes on and all that especially with the fact that a lot of human races that do see dwarves as less than human and so there is definitely those situations where they could run into slavery problems especially for human kingdoms that do condone slavery there have been rules put in place to make sure that they could never be enslaved and that has allowed for good negotiations as much as they are very isolated there are still some trade negotiations that do go on but very minimal and as the years have gone on the negotiations have dwindled down further and further and further during the golden age of course of the dwarven kingdom there were definitely a lot of trading going on especially with the height of rune crafting itself, rune crafting really put a spotlight on the Dwarven Kingdom. It allowed them to flourish and grow very largely because of the fact that they had technology and knowledge as a whole that was so vastly in demand. Again, supply and demand. These dwarves had something very powerful, full of potential, but once the 13 heroes appeared, and of course new players entered the field, things have constantly changed. And that is one of the big things that I've mentioned in a previous video is when new players enter the new world, it has changed the dynamics and sort of the rippling effect of how kingdoms and empires and technology and knowledge has been distributed. And that is definitely something that has affected the Dwarven Kingdom. They've risen to a massive height because of rune crafting, and then once more players possibly appeared later on, that brought in tier magic, and tier magic really made rune crafting obsolete. As much as rune crafting can look pretty and definitely has some interesting uses, as I've mentioned in that other video, it really put rune crafting at a disadvantage because tier magic was just a lot easier, a lot better. It gave distinct advantages, and it just worked well with the human races that could learn it at a lot easier pace. And that is just something that sadly made rune crafting very obsolete because of the enchanting aspects that, again, tier magic can do. It has left to their downfall because they weren't growing and having vast knowledge and wealth thrown at them. And of course, that would allow them to build a massive military might. It left to them running into a lot of problems with the natives that live in the same mountains as they do. The demi-human-like mole people, the Quagga, a tribal race that is very primitive, very sort of animalistic instincts that just attack randomly, try and steal, that kind of stuff. But as time has gone on, they have become a lot more tribal-based. They have become a lot more calculated. They have sort of united, sort of almost under one banner due to certain reasons that are in the light novel itself, which has definitely put a hindrance on the Dwarven Kingdom. And that is probably one of their biggest problems is that the Dwarven Kingdom became very relaxed, very content in where they were positioned, and this allowed them to suffer a massive obstacle of losing two of their cities. They have lost a lot of power, not just in military, diplomatic, negotiations, trading, and of course, knowledge and power. This has definitely left them into sort of the downfall age. You know, they had their peak, their golden age of room crafting at its peak potential, but then later on, as it became obsolete, it left to their downfall. Their golden years had fell apart, of course, due to the demon god's attacks on the nations and destroying, of course, the ancient capital the Quaggar having a massive effect on them and again this has left their people 
fleeing their royal family members wiped out because of the attacks and then the rest of them going against the demon gods itself the dwarven people have definitely suffered at the hands of a lot of foes and a lot of enemies and they have definitely tried to rise up to the challenge to try and combat this evil as a whole and that is one of the things i love about the dwarven kingdom they are there to try and fight the better battle but at the same time they had a lot of the odds stacked against them but time has not been good to them. As time has gone on, they've become very isolated. They've become quite selfish in themselves. It kind of reminds me a little bit of goblins in sort of the lore that is in other games and other light novel series where goblins are always seen as selfish, cunning, greedy. I almost sometimes feel like the Dwarven Kingdom became a little bit like that in a sense. But of course, there are always some good apples and there are always some rotten apples when it comes to sort of a collective group. I still do believe though, as time has gone on they have not aged well as a race because of course all the downfalls that they have received has definitely left some sour individuals feeling a little bit hurt because of the golden age that they were able to experience they kind of reminisce on that and they kind of wish that they could go back to those days where things were a lot better for them as an individual or as a sort of small group but as mentioning before about the golden age and the downfall, this also has a bit of an impact, of course, on the military strength. As much as the dwarven army itself is not large and vast in their numbers, they are very powerful and strong in their small collective groups. And because of sort of the design of the caves and the caverns and everything going on underground in those mountains, they have been able to make some choke points, stopping, of course, the demi-humans that are attacking them, trying to take their cities away from them. That has allowed the dwarven people to create choke points and gain a military advantage. But still, nonetheless, it has not always worked in their favor, and they have been losing sort of a military standpoint little by little by little just because of the fact that they haven't been able to sort of rebuild and build that numbers back up. As much as they are strong, they lack numbers, and that's what the Quaggar have that the Dwarven people don't have. They have the numbers, the Dwarven people have the strength, but they lack the numbers, which can then become overwhelming. And I think that's where Irons, or the Sorcerer Kingdom, has definitely been a great help for the Dwarven Kingdom, because one of the things they lacked was manpower, the ability to fight back an almost endless army. As much as the Quaggar aren't so endless, but it does feel like it's an endless army to the Dwarven Kingdom itself because there's just so many of them and it goes so deep into the mountains that you could never really fully clean them out unless you had a vast, strong military might, not just in strength alone, but in numbers to wash them out. And there are, of course, many other things hiding in the Dwarven Kingdom caves and the mountain itself that we know from the light novels. There are some things deep, deep underground that we don't fully know about that we can definitely speculate about that we do know that there is something down there deep and of course we know about some of the dragons that are of course residing in the mountains themselves that love money wealth powerful golden shimmering items themselves that they like to sort of nest themselves on and that is definitely another hindrance of course on the dwarven people and the kingdom as a whole having dragons hide in the mountains themselves and not necessarily hide being almost in plain sight but of course being deep embedded into those mountains along with the quaggar it definitely puts a lot of problems on the Dwarven Kingdom. And because they are so isolated and they don't have good trade negotiations going on, they don't have good relations with other kingdoms, it makes it hard for the Dwarven Kingdom to go to the tables of other demi-humans or other human kingdoms and say, hey, we would like to request assistance and in exchange we could give you other things in exchange. A good trade you scratch my back, I scratch your back. And because the Dwarven people don't have much to offer anymore, because they have fell from the Golden Age due to many different factors, of course, one of the major factors being, of course, the Demon God's invasion or attack or however you want to put it, definitely made it really hard for the Dwarven people to come to the negotiation tables of other races itself and say, hey, we need help. Which is why 
Irons and the Sorcerer Kingdom has definitely been a blessing in a disguise because Irons wanted something that they did not want. They gave up on runecrafting, they don't care about it anymore. As I've mentioned in a previous video, it is basically to them an obsolete, unneeded art of knowledge. They don't care for it because it's no longer of relevance and usefulness, seen as tier magic can do everything rune magic can do, if not better. And that's the point. Runecrafting used to be very big to them because it used to be very powerful back then. But with tier magic being introduced because, of course, a player or players, as time has gone on, it's been a bigger influence pushing and pushing and pushing to other races. This has made runecrafting obsolete which has left to their downfall. So they've had to adapt to using tier magic. But because they don't sell runecrafting based items, they've lost that heavy negotiations. Of course they could sell materials, but again the Quagga have been a massive hindrance. And that's the other problem. It's left to one problem after another for the Dwarven Kingdom. Yes, they could adapt to maybe selling materials like ore, etc. Because again, the Dwarven people are very good at mining. But because of the Quagga taking over so many positions, so many of their major footholds, and of course their two major cities, that has hurt their ability to mine and gather resources. Which in the light novels, if you read in the later on volumes, you will notice that a particular dwarf is going into very dangerous territory to try and mine some rare ore to hopefully become rich and wealthy. That is a major thing. A lot of the rare ore that the dwarven people used to mine is in enemy territory. Which, again, puts another hindrance. It's one problem after another. Iron's been able to take that land back for them and offer labor to help them mine. They can mine, Iron's can mine some, Iron's can gain some, they gain something. It's a win-win situation for all parties and every party gains something quite significant. If anything, the Dwarven Kingdom get the best part of the deal. They get their cities back. They get key strongholds back, they get their mining potential back, and they're able to mine and gather resources and be able to trade not just with the Sorcerer Kingdom, but also with other kingdoms. Because they'll be able to mine without the hindrance, of course, the dragons and the Quaggar. But it also depends on the Dwarven Kingdom if they want to trade with other individuals or if Irons tries to gain an exclusive right or just buys up as much as possible. It really comes down to the negotiations, the nitty gritties and if those things kind of change. But it also depends if they have the resources and of course the manpower as much as they are getting manpower from the Sorcerer Kingdom. If they have the extra manpower they may decide to do negotiations with other individuals like the Baratheon Empire. Another group of individuals that, as I mentioned before, that were very big on trading during their golden age. As much as they were very isolated, they still had good trade negotiations with some other human empires. And the Baratheon Empire gave them exclusive rights to not be used as slaves, because again, they have slavery in those kingdoms. So they may decide to go back to the negotiation tables with them. It completely depends on if they have the resources and the power to do it. Again, even though, yes, they are borrowing some of the Sorcerer Kingdoms, but most of that is, again, going to be probably traded with Irons and the Sorcerer Kingdom, and Irons is going to accumulate a large amount of power and wealth from doing all this. He's a very smart man when it comes to businesses, which you can't knock him for. But overall, I feel like the Dwarven Kingdom has a lot of interesting built-in lore. They have grown quite a lot. They've had their rise. They've had their fall. And for many different reasons, it isn't just one deciding factor of why they fell as a race. Yes, you could say that the demon gods themselves are one of the major factors when it comes to their kingdoms and their people and their royal families being destroyed. But as an economic standpoint, they have definitely suffered because of the players that have been summoned to this world. As much as I believe players have helped them rise because of course the introduction of runecrafting, which again is in a previous video, and I do have the theory that runecrafting is something that has come from the same game as Irons is used to, that Irons plays, but again, it, it all comes down to theories and whether we do find out some solid facts on where runecrafting exactly comes from and what are these sort of requirements of gaining it, if it's just a race requirement and only dwarves can use it, what the requirements are, 
that is completely up for debate because again we don't know but my general theory is that it was introduced with a player and then the dwarven people were able to learn this because again it's an exclusive race thing and that is what's helped them rise because of a player and then the downfall has been another player introducing tier magic so they had the rise they had the fall on the economic standpoint as i mentioned the economic standpoint is that factor while the military and these sort of kingdoms itself has definitely been in hindrance because of the demon gods dragons the quagga many big things have definitely hurt the dwarven kingdom on many different fronts so again i'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below what are your thoughts about this what are your general theories and opinions about where the dwarven kingdom will go just your overall thoughts in the comment section down below are definitely welcome but if you like this video hit the like button subscribe for more anime content and i'll see you beautiful nerds in the next video